How are you today? I'm doing pretty well, Matt. Or, damn it. <laughs> I called you Matt. I gotta not do that, eh? <laughs> I, I don't care. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is Chance. He's one of my friends that play tests all my maps. I decided to see if he was up to the task of learning how to make his own map from scratch to get a better understanding of what someone with no prior knowledge would go through in the build process. I'm going to have him document everything he does in this process, see where he struggles on his own, and what kind of questions I haven't even thought to answer in my basic tutorials. This might become too long for a single video, so sub to my channel if you like this and want to see the rest of this experience. Be sure to stay tuned till the end of the video to see some extra little funny bits. So, you don't have any map making experience at all for Assetto Corsa. Or any racing game, really. <laughs> Do you have any map making experience for any game? Uh, only in like the shooter arenas that it came built into the game, so other than that, no. <laughs> okay, so you've made your own maps before, just not to this level. Not even close, yeah. Alright. You are specifically someone that tests a lot of my maps before they're released. Yeah. What do you think watching me go through that process is going to be the biggest struggle with building your own track from scratch? Uh, well, I do believe because I am relatively new to drifting that actual track design will probably be my biggest hurdle. Uh, you know, knowing what, what yeah, like what corners uh, I can do and what angles to flow into each other and stuff. I'm I'm sure I'm probably gonna do a lot of testing there. And then finally. On a scale of 1 to 10, how difficult do you think this is going to be overall? Uh, being, you're going to blow your brains out. <laughs> well, don't push me to that point, please. But uh, probably about a 6 or 7, depending on when that first snag comes. That's probably what it'll be. Oh, it'll come. Oh, I know. <laughs> and now that you know who Chance is and his experience level with this stuff, we can get started on day one. Okie dokie. Go ahead and open Racetrack Builder. Boom. All right. Chance decided early on that it would be smart to start off with a little drift circuit, and then once he learns what he's doing, to make a larger map in the future. So we hop straight into his map, he intuitively named First Track. First things first, we had to go over how to place roads, so I had him pick his road texture and start going to town. So, to get started, you have that plus symbol next to your mouse, so that means you're ready to start placing track nodes. And to place the first one, yep, you just click and drag. Okay. While Chance was placing his nodes, he also learned how to move around by using right-click to angle the camera and WASD to move forward, back, and side to side. The camera can get pretty wonky in Racetrack Builder at times, so you'll see him slowly adjust to using it over the course of the video. He also figures out that you can use Control z to undo anything that you may have misplaced, as well as pushing the spacebar to go into Drive and Fly Camera Mode. Chance finishes up placing the segments of the track that he wants, stopping when the length of the track turns red, so we can go back to the start of the track to figure out how to get the right width he wants for a realistic road. To do this, we're going to use the road cross-section. There is a little move symbol with a line under it. Uh, yep. Perfect. So that's the cross-section tool. And as you can see, there's a cross-section right at the beginning of that road. If you click on it, you can see all of the segments of that road that give it all of those polygons that you just saw. It kind of looks like so, a trap you would see in Home Alone. To get a better understanding of the scale of his road, I had him import an X-Pack I frequently use to test the scaling that simply has a bunch of parked cars. He goes to Edit, X-Packs, and then selects the one he wants and hits OK. I have him place a single object by picking the red objects button, then clicking the drop down and selecting the cars category. From there, he selects the first car in the pack, making sure it's the only object in the hotbar that's selected. He places the car and uses the move object tool to orient it the way he wants. He figures that part out pretty easily. Now that we have a sense of scale, I explained to Chance the concept of a cross section and how they can help him make his track a bit better. I explained that the cross sections are used to add curvature and or angle to your track with varying degrees. Cross sections are made up of several nodes that are not necessarily evenly spaced. The numbers you can see in between each spike or node corresponds to the distance between them. So moving a single node in the cross section up or down will only affect the distance to and from the nodes adjacent. Moving a node in the track will warp just that point in the track leading back to the previous cross section. 
I also advised on the ability to right-click when you have a cross-section selected, hitting Align, then 100% to ensure that every node in that cross-section is perfectly aligned and equidistant. Lastly, I explain the arrows. The inner white arrows are used to tilt the entire road while leaving the points outside untouched, while the outer white arrows will only affect the roadsides that are used to help gradually morph your road to the existing terrain. The yellow arrows are used to keep the entire track and side surfaces level while raising all of the elevations. And finally, the blue arrows are used to stretch the entirety of the segment, road sides and all. So let's, fi let's fix our width. Right. So go ahead to the cross section tool. Yep. And then go ahead and go to that first, uh, that first section that we did, that we already worked on. So click on the road. Perfect. Okay. Right click. Shape. Copy. Now, zoom out a little bit. And look at the, yep, right there. All right, right click, shape, paste, and then you're gonna click paste all tracks. Oh God, that's nice. Okay, so that changed the width to exactly what you had and made the roads completely flat. Chance went through the process of flattening his entire track so we can add our own banked corners manually and finish the rest of the segments to complete his track. He then realized there was a corner that he felt was a bit too harsh, so we went over how to insert new nodes to a pre-existing track. So now, you are in node view, which is where you need to be. So here's what I'm going to have you do. All right. Go in between those two nodes right there at the... Yeah, yep. Go right in the center. Control left click. Now you have a new node to work with. You can do that anywhere and just add a new node to work with. It's just control click. Nice and easy yep. like that. Yep. Beauty. That also works for string objects as well. Anything that that has a, uh, a node system. He finishes tidying his nodes up and making sure everything was to his liking at the moment, and then the track was ready for testing. I'm skipping over us actually exporting the project and going through the file structure here, as I already have the file structure pretty well laid out in my first basic tutorial. I'll put a card on screen somewhere now so you can reference that if you need help. If we did everything right, you should be able to hit go and not have it crash. Okay, so it is nighttime here. Okay. Everyone can see me suck, awesome. <laughs> Chance was right. He does suck. But not necessarily for the lack of skill. You see, the problem he's having revolves entirely around depth perception. With nothing but flat land and road surface, there's no way to gauge how sharp or how wide corners are. A good starting point for helping you out with this is to import some grass effects, which you can start from scratch or configure manually. You can simply steal the extension folder from one of my maps and delete anything that doesn't have to do with grass. This will give you a good base and the ability to mess around with the values in that config file and learn what each setting does. After the extensions folder is in your track, you can hop back into Assetto, tweak any settings for it, and watch the changes happen live after each save. I'll be sure to leave a link to the Grass Effects wiki where I was able to get a majority of my information from, and a special thanks to Skullcrusher on Reddit and Race Department for helping me out with learning how to use it. My buddy finishes up doing his testing, and has made the executive decision to make some much needed changes to the layout of his track. He already knows the basics of how to move nodes, add them, and angle cross sections, so I let him cook for a bit to see what he can come up with. While he was working on that, he figured out that he can hold Y when selecting a node to adjust the height of the node, and use his knowledge from the cross section alignment we did to figure out how height adjustment works. Height Adjust is an extremely useful tool for building elevation changes in your road, but if you don't know how to properly use it, you can create some nasty bumps and dips. Let's take a look at how we can use this option while Chance is messing around with it. Here we have a straight road. I want to make a hump and a dip in this road, but I don't want to go flying or slam into the ground, so I need to make a smooth transition between them. After I've lifted and lowered my reference nodes to where I want them to be, I'm ready to start using the tool. Height Adjust acts as an averaging calculator. 
It takes the height of the first node selected and the last node selected and adjusts all the nodes in between to evenly angle the track to a straight line. You cannot use this tool unless you select three or more nodes. I'm going to select the peak node and the flat node. I do my 100% height adjustment, then I do the same to the other side. I repeat those steps for the dip on the other end of the track. Now I have a hump and a dip, but the transitions between them are a bit harsh, so let's smooth them out. I'll select one of the original reference nodes and the two nodes adjacent. Then I can height adjust to 50% to get a nice even curve for our transition. I'll do this for the whole track and let's see what we come up with. Now we have a nice smooth wave as opposed to a jagged peak and ditch. Let's go check back in with Chance. Looks like he's been able to work through the height adjustment tool where he needed to and has now moved on to placing some guardrails. Guardrails and other string objects function more or less like roads. They'll rest on the ground by default, and they can also take advantage of the height adjustment option. He found the properties menu as well that would allow him to not only change the scale of the string objects he's placing, but also the offset from the spline, the rotation of each individual segment, and the way the objects are actually placed, such as sitting on the spline itself or on the ground. He then moved into placing down some objects and remembered how to scale and rotate from earlier when we placed that car. And with that, we've reached the end of day one. This was our first session together and we went over quite a few things, so let's recap real quick. We made our first map. We learned how to place a road and connect segments to make our circuit. We learned how to export and test our track, including copying over grass effects from an existing map. We went over cross-section node alignment, angle, and road height adjustment and we ended things off with placing objects and string objects. With this, he should have everything he needs to start adding to his track and really making it his own, so let's see what he can come back with over the next few days. First. Sweet. We rejoin Chance in his first solo session the next day. He starts off by placing a porta potty and then adjusts some road angles using the cross-section knowledge he gained yesterday. After that, he decides he wants to test it to see if he likes the way it drives. However, he's running into a problem. No matter how many times he exports the map from Racetrack Builder or Chaos Editor, the map never updates in-game, so he goes back to the previous day's recording to figure out where he went wrong. This took him 25 minutes to figure out that he never actually copied the new exported files into his Assetto Track folder. Always remembering to do this or going back and rewatching a tutorial is never a bad idea and can save you a ton of headache. Once he figures it out, he starts testing for real. After testing, he found a need for more angle. I could tell just from watching him test that he likes the bank turns, so the first thing he does upon going back to the editor is start working on tilting more corners. He spent almost a half an hour working on angling the road, and then another 15 on adding some guardrails, and finally another 30 or so on placing objects to try and fill space before exporting for another round of testing. You can start to see how time-consuming this stuff is, even without having to learn on top of it. Chance came into this having never done track design, and it's easy to see he's figuring out as he goes. We started by building a drift circuit, but it seems he's branching off to try new things. I'm skipping a lot of this build, as there was much of the same as we've already seen from the previous clips, and Chance was having some indecisions regarding some of the choices he'd made. Here's his end result at this point. Some things he kept, and some he slightly altered. But the important thing is, he tried them, realized he didn't like them, and went back to make them better. He isn't making this map for me, he's not trying to make me like the map, he's making what he wants to make and so should you. Your maps don't have to be overly thematic or even realistic for that matter. All that really matters is that you enjoy driving them. Chances are, someone else will too when you're done. It's now time for our second session of mentoring so we can learn about a few more things that might allow Chance to make his map more unique or simply give him a route to carry out an idea he had. So, if you go up to your menu mm -hmm. and you go to the purple flag, this is everything regarding start, finish, checkpoints, mm. all that. So, if you zoom over to where the start is, you see that red car right in the center? Yep. Or orange, I guess? Move that off to the side. So that is your hot lap start. 
So if you go and start up a hot lap for this map, that's where you're going to spawn. Okay. However, if you see the whole bunch of cards that are stacked on top of each other, those are your pit starts. Okay. So drag the other end, uh, the side that's not where you want it to be. Yep. Drag it down that road, yeah. Yep, just like that. So now, what you can do, if you want them to start on the road, then you can leave it how, is it, how it is, and you can just grab the green circles and rotate them. Or, ah. you can make a little parking area and place them there. Chance liked the idea of a small separated pits area, so I gave him some time to get that set up, and we rejoin now to adjust some more regarding the pits and starting positions. Okay, so now hop into the uh, the purple start finish tool and move your pits over there. Whoops, there we go. And then use the green circle to rotate, that way you're actually facing the track. If you go back up to your menu, you can set how many spawns there are. So right now there's 20 teams. Those are essentially how many cars how many spots there are to spawn vehicles. Okay. I use plenty of room. Pretty good. That way, it's also a decent space if you just want to mess around and do, do circles, figure eights. All right. I know that ain't pretty, but, <laughs> but it um, actually, it's better than, what I'm, than starting it'll, over here it'll facing. Get there. It'll get there. Yeah. Chance is going to go back later after this session to fix up those pits and make it a bit cleaner, but right now, we're going to start to talk about walls. If you click on the pink brick icon, these are your walls. Okay. So, right now you have the first wall selected. That's perfect. That's what I wanted. Okay. Uh, click on the uh, the create new wall button and with the drop down and then select curve. And then go back over to your uh, pits. So what I'm having Chance do at this point to try and show how to cover up little mistakes like the transitions he has from the pits to the main track is to utilize the unique functionality that Racetrack Builder walls have that allow you to manipulate the cross sections of them. As stated earlier, some of the functions of roads carry over to string objects and other types of node utilizing features. One of those functions that roads have that you can also use with walls is the cross section tool. We do love ourselves some cross sections. So with roads, we would use the cross-section tool to flatten, add curvature, widen, or just simply add bumps to our roads, but with walls, we can use this a bit more creatively. The wall's cross-sections are simply the shape of the wall, so if we want to widen it, we would simply drag the two points here that make up one side of the wall, and we're done. Like with the road, and any other spline, adding new nodes to cross-sections functions exactly the same way. You can simply hit Control, left click, and create a new node. Utilizing the cross section of this wall, we can add a bunch of new nodes and create some pretty crazy shapes as I've done here. And the best part is, these shapes can still function exactly the same as normal walls when you set it as collidable in KS Editor. Circling back to Chance now, he decided to make a ramp onto his track. But for now, we're going to move on and let him work on that later so we can get to talking about terrain editing. Yeah, I was like, maybe if I, if I just make this into a little mountainous thing, that'd be kind of nice. Just so that, like, you're not looking off into yeah, Minecraft yeah, yeah. flat world. <laughs> okay, so you go up to the menu. We start off jumping into terrain editing with what I call the hill tool. On your menu bar, you have four options when this is selected. There are two sliders and two checkboxes. The first slider is how large of a surface area the tool covers, while the second is how strongly you want your hills to warp the land. So if you want a small hill that's barely noticeable, you'll set your size relatively low, and then your strength within the same area. If you wanted a large hill that's very tall, you would raise that size scale, and then move the lower slider higher up the bar. The first checkbox, labeled Subdivide Triangles, corresponds to the polygon count of your hill. As it stands, a new world will be flat and the terrain will have large polygons because there's no need for a ton of detail. If you're trying to make a small hill, you might have trouble because the tool acts by raising specific vertexes in the land. By turning on the subdivide triangle box, you can divide up the original polygons into smaller and smaller segments to work with, giving it more detail. 
This will in turn make your hills have a more gradual elevation change. The second checkbox has to do with hills near your roads. If you want to add a hill or dip, but are afraid of messing up the elevation of the roads, you would simply select this box to lock the nodes of your track to their pre-existing points. To make a hill, we would simply click and hold, then drag. To make a dip, you would do the exact same thing, but while holding shift, indicated by the ring turning blue. Moving on to the next tool in terrain editing, we have the flatten tool. This tool has the same four options and functions the same, but will flatten the land based on the original selection or click point. So if you want to make the top of a hill flatter, or simply get rid of a hill you made previously, this is the way to do it. The next tool we have is the terrain painting tool. This has the same two sliders, and we no longer have the lock track nodes box because we'll not actually be manipulating the terrain shape here. We also now have some texture options. Now, to be honest, I'm still trying to figure out how the heck this works myself, so forgive me for any mistakes here. Please leave a comment below if you know more and can provide some more knowledge. But this is what I've gathered from my time using it. To make things as simple as possible to understand for both of our sake, the first texture in the order is the base grass texture that your entire landmass will have. You can change this texture by double clicking on it and selecting a new texture. The next two textures are your way to paint onto the land. You can use these as you would expect. If you want the base of a hill to be sandy, make the texture sand and paint it on. If you don't have an image as your base image, you can also use the fourth option on the menu the same way. If you don't know what that means, don't worry about it yet. The white square is your mask. The way I understand this is, your map has one large sheet of nearly transparent color on top of it. If you use this white brush, you'll essentially be changing the color of that transparent layer. This seems to really only be all that useful if you have an image as your base, but I'm not getting into that at the moment because I still don't quite understand it. The last box you can click on I'm pretty sure is regarding the specular map of the textures, but mine does nothing when clicked, so I'm skipping over that as well. That now brings us to the detail tool. Remember when we went over the subdivide triangles checkbox a few moments ago? Well, you can actually modify the polygon count of your land manually using this tool. When you hover your cursor over a spot of land, you'll be able to see the size of the triangle that make it up. If you've not messed with the terrain at all, these will be as large as they can be, but if you've subdivided the triangles while making a hill or adding a road, you should see smaller ones. A simple use case for this tool would be for making some nice flowing mountains in the background of your map. You realize that these mountains are a ways away from the actual track and really won't be seen all that much, but you still want them there. What you can do to save resources and space is to turn down the fidelity or polygon count of the mountain in question. We can do this by moving our cursor to an area of the map that has larger polygons and simply clicking and dragging, highlighting the entire area we want to make less detailed. When you let go, you'll see the mountain is a bit more jagged and much lower poly. I use this in the background of all my maps to make them seem more full and also saving the user precious resources. Finally, we have the last option for editing terrain and unfortunately, I'm not extremely knowledgeable in this section either. Basically, this allows us to see all the vertexes that make up the polygons we just messed with, so that we can manually adjust specific terrain points. This can be extremely useful if you're having trouble with a very tight spot not morphing well with your track. There are also four boxes that go along with this that allude to being able to select many points at once. And like every other node using tool or object in this application, you have these height adjustments. They just come in the form of buttons as opposed to right clicking. When you have a set of these nodes selected, you can select one of these terrain morph options and lift or lower a specific point and it will follow the specified shape when it attempts to normalize. I don't really use these too often as I feel they're not as reliable as simply organically making my hills and transitions by hand. That was a lot of talking. Sorry about that. While we were going over the terrain tools, Chance took advantage of them and made a few modifications to his map, so we reconvened to test with him. The map is feeling better now in terms of terrain, but could use some sprucing up. 
I'll let him do that on his own time. At this point we've gone over everything he should need to modify his track the way he wants, and any other questions he might have are going to be most likely a bit too specific to include here, so I'm going to cut those out of the video as it's already long as hell as it is. Almost any question he has that I can't answer, I'm referring him to the guys over in the unofficial RTB Discord, as they've been a big help with not only answering my dumb questions, but also providing suggestions and input, being a hub for the best X-Pack downloads, and overall being a nice place to have conversations about the track building hobby. I'll leave a link to the Discord in the description for anyone that needs more help. With all this said, we're pretty much done with our second and final complete session together. These sessions were long and we went over a ton over the past few days, but now it's finally time to really let Chance have some freedom. I left Chance to work on his track for some time. When he was ready, I had him send over the files for his map so we can take a look. This is what he came up with. So this was more so an experiment for me rather than wanting to teach my buddy how to do this. When I make tutorials, I want to answer the questions that you might have in the video so it's easier for both of us. Going through this whole process with Chance was extremely beneficial, and he asked a ton of great questions that even had me stumped, so you probably will have some too. If so, feel free to leave a comment and I'll try and answer every one of them when I can. With the video coming to a close. I asked Chance if he actually enjoyed this experience. In his response, he stated he had already started on a new map as I'm editing this together, and it looks way more polished than this first one does. I think that answers that question. <laughs> I'm not going to post a link to his track download, as I'll leave that up to him to decide if he wants to share it online. I want to thank Chance first and foremost for the effort and persistence he's put in with this experiment, as I knew this was going to be a long and drawn out process. I also want to thank the people that provided input and feedback on the early stages of this video, the guys over in the RTB Discord, and finally, you. When I started this video idea, I was just starting to see a rise in subscribers from the 24 hour track build video, and holy shit you guys came through after, so I guess this is my 1000 sub special. I'm going to continue pumping out tracks as best I can for you guys, and make tutorials where I see gaps that necessitate one. But if I'm honest, there are already a ton of really in-depth tutorials scattered throughout YouTube. Either way, I urge you, if you're even thinking about taking on track building, don't get discouraged. We all start from the beginning. I think of it like this. Success and failure are both success. You have to try in order to succeed, and when you don't succeed, take that failure as a learning experience. Learning new things is always considered success in my book. Take those first steps, and I'll be here to help along the way in whatever way I can. Once again, thank you all for watching all the way through to the end, or skipping around and you decided you wanted to see my final thoughts, no shame, I appreciate it nonetheless. If this helped you, encouraged you, inspired, enraged, anything at all, and feel you need a way to show your appreciation, feel free to simply hit subscribe and drop a like so you can come back and review sections of the video later. All right. As always, GG's. All right. I realize there's potential to make a fidget spinner, and I'm not going to do it. I mean, you could. No, it's not allowed. <laughs> okay.
as it stands, a new... Yes, yes, cat. Thank you. Much appreciated. Are you done? Switch. What? I'm like, I'm gonna go work over here. All right, I'll leave you to yourself. I don't know what happened. Moving on to the next tool in the terrain editing. Moving on to the next tool in terrain editing, we have the flatten tool. This tool has the same four options and functions as the same. Moving on to the next tool in the Moving on to the next tool over there and go to a bird's eye view. Oh, crud. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Where? Scroll wheel. Scroll wheel. I know, that's the problem. I scroll yeah. wheeled when I was... I can't yeah, find okay. land. Uh, go up to the menu and then hit edit. Reset camera. Oh, perfect. There you go, everyone. That's going to save you. Yes, if you guys okay. ever scroll wheel out here, there you go, that'll save you. So go to that left corner right there and go to a bird's eye. <laughs> <Bro. Yeah. laughs> Ugh. You know what's funny is I'm already like thinking of, of the next track that I want to make. <laughs> Curse you, Matt. You know what you've done now? You give me a new hobby. Thank you. <laughs> Which I'm fairly certain he has given many other new people. At least I hope so. That'd be cool. Go make tracks, people. It's fun. Can't confirm. <laughs>